Yay, we're live and direct. <laughs> it's not New York. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone, to Eliminating Self-Sabotage. I'm so, so, so excited to be here with all of you. It is just wonderful. And I'm so excited to be able to share this amazing, life-changing information. It really is. It really is. So uh, let's see, what else do I want to do? Oh, I want to open the chat window too, because I need to do that as well. So let's see, where's the chat window? It's around here somewhere. <laughs> okay. All right. And then here we go. Chat window. Let me put that. Let's see. Over there. All right. So this is good. Okay. So we're ready to rock and roll. <sighs> This is so great. What better thing to do on a very, very hot Saturday afternoon? You don't even want to go outside. <laughs> it's a hundred and, let's see, last I checked, it was 110 degrees in Sacramento. <laughs> so thank you for being here. It's absolutely wonderful. So I always like to start off with a story. So I'm going to share a very personal story about me and my self-sabotage. So it was 30 years ago, 30 years ago. And I was 55 pounds heavier than you see me today. I had high blood sugar, high, high blood sugar, about 128 pre-diabetic, high cholesterol, 270, not good. High blood pressure, 170 over 110, not good either. So I had issues. And I went to the doctor and the doctor even told me I had issues. I didn't care. I didn't care because I was depressed. You see, four and a half years earlier, in October of 1990, I had ruptured my Achilles tendon, snapped it right off while playing basketball. And I had emergency surgery the next day. Now, the doctor afterwards, he said, Ruben, it was so badly frayed on each side that we had to actually pull it all together and splice it into another tendon just to try to keep it together. Wow. And then he said, you'll be lucky if you can walk normally again. Ugh, that wasn't very good. And of course, I had to ask. Will I be able to play basketball again? Because basketball is like therapy for me. And he said, don't even think about it, Ruben. You're done. That was devastating. So I proceeded to do what any hardworking, responsible, intelligent, depressed person does when they are depressed. Yes, I ate all the processed food and junk food I could find. Why? Because I didn't care. I was depressed. Like, it was over. I had been given an ultimate sentence of no joy ever again. So that was depressing. And, of course, I would just gorge. And in fact, I started working in healthcare administration shortly thereafter. I was at Kaiser Hospital where I was working. And I would leave my office at five o'clock in the afternoon. No lie, this is what I would do every single day. I'd leave my office and head up to the gift shop in the hospital. Now, if you've ever been in a hospital gift shop, you know they do not have healthy food options available for you. So what I got every single day was my fix. Oh, it might as well have been an injection, but it wasn't. So I got the large Mountain Dew. I didn't play small. I got the king size bag of M&Ms. I got the six Oreo cookies. And I got the large three Musketeers bar. Every afternoon, that was my package. Took it with me and ate that in the car and drank it while I was on my way to coach my swimmers. The rest of my diet was not much better. So what happened over the course of those four and a half years, I blew up. And I saw the doctor 
that still didn't make an impression on me. So then uh, early January, so it was January, 1995. I'm coaching a swim meet in California, in Sacramento area. And a friend of mine who had seen me when I was healthy and fit, he saw me. He knew what I was like beforehand. And he walked up to me and he leaned in, said, getting a little chubby there, Ruben, turns and walks away. Wow. I was so mad. I was furious. And mind you, I wanted to throw the buttermilk donut that I had in my hand at him, but I didn't want to waste the donut. Now, if you can feel that, you truly are my friend. Now, I had to have a day of reckoning. The next day was the day of reckoning for me because I had to look at myself in the mirror. And I realized, Ruben, you have done this to yourself. Not intentionally, but you've done this to yourself. It's not mom. It's not dad. It's not my ex-wife. No, nobody else. It's all me. Now, that's humility. And it's not comfortable at, at all. And I realized I had to do what I knew I needed to do, but I was resisting it because I was letting that little voice inside my head run the show. And we're going to talk about that little voice. I have a couple of friends with me here. Yeah, the monkey mind. My monkey was running the show. And I had to realize that it was running the show and I had to rewire my subconscious mind. Now, I don't know about you, but I never got a class in high school or in college or even graduate school on how to successfully rewire your subconscious mind. Never got that. But I have since learned how to do that. And I learned what to, what to do and how to apply it. What I'm going to share with you today is powerful information on how to successfully rewire and train your subconscious mind. That's what we're going to go into today. So uh, if, for those of you who logged, who registered early enough, I sent you an email with your worksheets. So make sure you have those. If, if you didn't get those in time, then what I will do is send it to you afterwards. So you'll get it. So don't worry. So let me set up to go ahead and go to my PowerPoint so that we can start. So give me a moment here. Okay. All right, so give me a few moments. I gotta do a few clicks here. All right, let me move this over here. And then I have to do this. And then I have to do this and this. And share my screen, PowerPoint, and share, and we should be good. Good. Can everybody see in here? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. All right, so very good. So today, eliminating self-sabotage. When I saw this picture, I said, I've got to have this. <laughs> because you know what? Even Buddha had a monkey mind. As the Buddhists, the Buddhists refer to the subconscious mind as the monkey mind. And it's so powerful because guess what? We've got that little voice sitting on our shoulder and whispering in our ear and saying, do it, don't do it. You know you want to, don't you dare. No one will know, wait and see, you deserve it. I mean, it happens all the time, it happens all the time. So we've all got that, we've all got that. So let me tell you a little bit about me and then we're gonna dive right in, all right? So a little bit about me, I did my undergraduate training at beautiful, uh, Southern California, California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. It was absolutely wonderful. And I graduated with my bachelor's in biological sciences pre-med. And then I knew I wanted to go to medical school, but I wasn't ready. So I worked for a, um, in the hospital for a couple of years as a pathologist assistant. And I looked at everything that came out of the operating room and I did autopsies. And I did all kinds of things. It was amazing. Then off I went to UC Davis School of Medicine. And it was wonderful. Moved up to Northern California. And I realized that I was, I was starting to look at the connection between lifestyle and longevity. And I started to do research in this regard. 
And when I shared my findings with my advisor, he said, Ruben, you're onto something. But quite frankly, we don't have the resources here for you. So he recommended that I check out the school or schools of public health, either Berkeley or UCLA. Well, for me, it had to be UCLA. So off I went to UCLA. I loved it. It was amazing. I loved my program. I got to do some of the most amazing things. And I worked with some of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my entire life. It was fantastic. And when I finished my master's in public health, I realized that I was passionate about promoting health and preventing disease. And I was no longer interested in treating disease. So I made a bold decision to not go back to medical school to finish my MD, but to pursue studying lifestyle medicine on my own. So that's what I did. And in 2011, I even wrote a book on health after uh, stepping into consulting for many years. But then in 2016, I discovered that there is now a new specialty of the American Medical Association. You may not have heard of it, but it is called the American College of lifestyle medicine. Yes, a legitimate specialty of the, of the American Medical Association. I just love this. And I found out about it in a conference in 2016. Lifestyle medicine is the use of evidence-based therapeutic intervention, including a whole food plant predominant eating pattern, regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connection. As a primary modality, let's do this first. We recommend this first to prevent, treat, and often reverse chronic disease. I was so elated. I was ecstatic when I found out about this. And I found out some, some of the founders of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine include some of the luminaries that I had been following for many years, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Esselstyn, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. They're all involved. Yes. Wow. This is amazing. This is amazing. So I was so ecstatic because lifestyle medicine is about being able to address the cause, not just treat the symptoms. So we look at all of these modalities as the spokes of your wheel of health. And it makes sense. It absolutely does. And to me, when it comes to empowering people to actually change their lifestyle for the better, yes, nutrition is important. Yes, hydration is important. Yes, sleep is important. Yes, physical activity is important. Yes, happiness is important. Yes, relationships are important. Yes, alcohol and tobacco reduction is important. But you know what? Our emotional well-being and our subconscious mind runs the show. If we don't address this, if we don't start and begin from within, the game is over. You can have all the information on what recipes to cook and everything else, but if you don't have your mindset in the right position, in the right place, you're done. You're cooked. And it's the same in sports. It's the same in business. It doesn't matter what you do. Your mindset and being able to actually deal with your subconscious wiring is critical to your success. It is. So in 2016, I found out about lifestyle medicine. In October 2018, I became one of the first board-certified lifestyle medicine professionals. So for PhDs and those with a master's in a health-related field, I was so thrilled. I can't even begin to tell you how proud, proud I am, how thrilled I am. I found my tribe after 30 years. Yes, amazing. Amazing. So it's been extraordinary for me and I just love it. And it just completely validates everything that I've been believing in for 40 years, over 40 years. So I'm also a member of the Institute of Coaching out of Harvard. And if you Google my name, yes, I did write these three books in the sport of swimming. I wrote the first comprehensive drill book in the sport of swimming, swimming drills for every stroke. It's been updated twice. It's now the swimming drill book. And it's the best selling swimming drill book in the entire world. I'm sold 552 copies. Yes. And it's been translated to five other languages. That was a joke, by the way. So the thing about it is this. Oh, oh yeah. I also wrote two other books. So this one is Evolving Health, endorsed by Dr. Neil Barnard in 2011. And this is the mock up cover of my book to be released by the end of this year. How to Fully Live, a Transformational Approach to Creating a Thriving, Healthy, and Happy Life. 
what we're going to cover today is actually one of the chapters in the book. I have a chapter on eliminating self-sabotage. And for you being here today, guess what? You're going to get a draft copy of that chapter. That's a gift, free gift to you that I'm going to send off to you. Every one of us in lifestyle medicine, we understand this quote so powerfully. And Thomas Edison said this well over 100 years ago, that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will instruct his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And this is what lifestyle medicine is doing today. It is so awesome. By the way, just so you know, exciting news, breaking news, the president-elect of the American Medical Association is a board certified lifestyle medicine physician. Yes. Yes. And we've got several board members that are lifestyle medicine physicians as well in the American Medical Association. So we are changing healthcare for the better. It's so exciting. Oh my God, get ready. Now, I also want to let you know, I have absolutely no conflicts of interest whatsoever. I got no products, I got no gimmicks, no schemes, not like Dr. Gundry or any one of those guys. Okay, so no, 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 no. All right, so I believe, and all of us in lifestyle medicine, we all believe that Virgil was correct when he said over 2000 years ago that the greatest wealth that any of us can have truly is our health. It really is. But most of us don't live with that as our crux of what is most important. We don't see that as a priority. It's very interesting. We live in a world where most people displace taking care of themselves. They just do. They just do because they put more, more emphasis on making money. In fact, it was interesting. The Dalai Lama put it really well when he was asked what surprised him most about humanity. He said, man sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money in a desperate attempt to try to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and then dies having never really lived. A sad but sobering truth. And I've seen this far too many times. The reason we get into this predicament is because of our beliefs. We believe that money is more important than health. We believe that we can get away with no sleep, working 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. We believe that we can do all those things and we'll be just fine. In psychology, and I taught psychology at the university level for several years, psychology, we define beliefs as thoughts trusted to be true. They're just trusted to be true. They're not necessarily the truth. They're strongly held opinions, and guess what? We've all got them. We've all got opinions. It's interesting because what we do as human beings is we tend to operate as if our beliefs are the truth. But that's not necessarily the case. We don't question our beliefs, we just hold them as absolute. So it's interesting. If you lived a thousand years ago in Europe, and if you believed that the earth was spherical, was a ball, you could potentially be imprisoned or even put to death. Galileo was imprisoned for having that belief. Because back then, everybody believed that the earth was flat. Well, and these days, there are still some people who still believe that the earth is flat. I've met a few fascinating conversations because they're attached to their beliefs. We are all conditioned to believe what we believe. We may not see it that way, but it's absolutely true. We are all conditioned to believe what we believe. Now, if you took psychology, you remember Pavlov's little dog. Conditioning, yeah, operant and classical conditioning. 
So we're all conditioned to believe how we believe. And we don't realize there's so many forces influencing us to believe what we believe. In fact, I'll prove it to you right now. See if you can complete this jingle. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, you know the rest. Oh, what a relief it is. By the way, that ad hasn't played in over 45 years. <laughs> See, we got so conditioned by the advertisers, advertisers. And advertising agencies and advertising gurus have known this well over 100 years. They've been doing this intentionally. In fact, here are some ads from 100 years ago. None of us are old, old enough to remember, but these are actual ads. On the upper left, Nico Times cigarettes, the smooth taste pregnant mothers crave. Wow. Upper right, no flies on me, thanks to DDT. Well, you're a smiling baby, not for long. All right, and then you got the lower left, and this is the first product of the Bayer Aspirin Company. Heroin hydrochloride for your headaches. Mm. Yes, they, re they absolutely relieved your headaches, and yes, it was legal. And then on the lower right, let this magic mineral asbestos protect the buildings on your farm. Now we can't get rid of it fast enough. So should we always trust the marketing? <laughs> Consider, my friends, every single one of us, and this is important for what we're going to step into today. Consider that we have all, every single one of us, myself included, we have all been duped, hoodwinked, bamboozled, and deceived. I love that one. <laughs> so your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to be really receptive and open-minded and question your beliefs today. Question it for this next hour, two and a half, two hours, okay, for the next two hours, hour and a half, a little bit more than that. Just question your beliefs. Question them. Don't hold on to them like they are the truth. No. Just question them. I wish more people would operate this way all the time, but it's really powerful. One of my favorite teachers who taught me this a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, he said that <clears throat> you must not learn what you have learned. So I'm hoping that you're willing to heed Yoda's advice. So here's what we're going to cover today. We got lots, lots to cover. So we're going to first talk, talk about the context of how we create our lives. Very powerful. We're going to look at the psychological model. Secondly, we're going to look at how our strategies and habits hold us back, particularly our strategies. Then we're going to look at this model that I have created for the mechanism of self-sabotage based on the, the wisdom of so many of my teachers in psychology. And then we're going to look at the steps and practices that you can take starting today to start the process of rewiring your subconscious mind. Yes. And then we'll finish up by talking about how you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. Feel free to take notes. Now, by the way, you're going to get a, a follow-up email. And in that email, you're going to get a recording of today's webinar. You're also going to get all the slides. So don't worry about taking copious notes. So you're going to get all the slides. You're also going to get lots of resources. So I, I'm very generous. And I'm going to give you plenty of resources. I was a university professor, and I love giving homework. <laughs> so you're going to get plenty. So you're going to get lots and lots of information. Also, information about my services. You're going to get everything, okay? So you're going to get plenty of information. So enjoy. Be participating. Now, if you have the worksheets that I sent you by email, it might be a good idea for you to print those out and have them ready because it's really helpful to be able to do that and have a pen and, and, uh, or a pencil with your worksheets. And we'll get to that when it's time. So just have those ready to go. All right, let's dive in. So some powerful quotes from some of my favorite teachers around self-sabotage and the psychology of the sub subconscious mind. One of them is Gary John Bishop, who wrote some really profound books. I'll let you know about that later. But he said this very powerful insight. Consider, just consider 
that you have the life right now. What you have is your life is the you have the life you're willing to put up with. So if you're struggling, if you're frustrated, if you're annoyed, consider that is what is there because you're willing to put up with it. If you're not willing to put up with it, you're going to change it. You're going to take action. Powerful insight. It's kind of a slap in the face to me. <laughs> so it's powerful to look at this. One of the fa founding fathers of modern psychology is Dr. Carl Jung. And he said this, that one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. I, I once heard Marianne Williamson say, imagine being in an orb of light, a glowing, warm, golden light. No, that's not enlightenment. <laughs> Sorry. I love Marianne Williamson, but that's not enlightenment, okay? So the thing about it is that we have to make our darkness, we have to become aware of it, make it conscious. So that's what we're going to dive into today. Now, one of the things to look at, when another one of my favorite teachers, Debbie Ford, and she said this, that our shadows, our shadows hold the essence of who we are. They hold our most treasured gifts, by facing these aspects of ourselves, we become free to experience our glorious totality, the good and the bad, the dark and the light. And we all have this. We all have, this is the subconscious, the, the shadow or the, the subconscious is all the same. So we have to be willing to look at this. It's so powerful. And I love one of my favorite teachers is Yogananda. I've been, I was a yoga teacher for 15 years and so much wisdom. And so I love what he said here is that millions of people, millions of people never analyze themselves mentally. They are mechanical products of the factory of their environment, preoccupied with breakfast, lunch, and dinner working and sleeping and going here and there to be entertained. They don't know what or why they are seeking, nor why they never realize complete happiness and lasting satisfaction. By evading self-analysis, people go on, go on being robots, conditioned by their environment, True self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. Wow. 1946. Powerful wisdom. If you have not seen the Matrix four-part movies, four movies, you need to watch it. Bruce Lipton, one of my teachers, he says, the Matrix is not science fiction it is a documentary because what we how we live in the world that we live today we are basically living in the matrix we're walking around with our faces in our phones i remember working with a client in san francisco for several months i'd get off the bart on Market Street and walk up to the Trans Transamerica building. And I would just take note, how many people did I have eye to eye contact with in that walk of a mile and a half? The average was two people per walk. That was it. Everybody else had their face in their phones. We're living in the matrix today and we're disconnected from reality. So now the question is this, how did you get to be the person that you are today? What shaped you, what molded you, what contributed to you being who you are today? So go ahead and write your answers in the chat. All right, what contributed to you being who you are today? What molded you, what shaped you? The person that you've become today has been influenced by what? 
Write some in. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You got to be active in this. Come on. I can't do it all. You're going to have to participate today. Okay. Your parents. Great. All right. Genetics. Yes, absolutely. Environment. Yes. God. Family. Friends. School. Media. Big one. Yes, absolutely. School. Yes. Sister Mary Pilar, Sister Mary St. Christopher, Sister Mary Leah Christia, Sister Mary Lenore. I mean, yeah, all of these. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Come on, give it to me. Television. Yes, absolutely. Significant emotional events. Yes, powerful, right? Powerful. Those things that happen that really jolt us. Absolutely. What else? What else? Come on, give me more. Give me more. Okay, five more. Come on. Come on. Influenced by my mentors. Yes, people who are actually, yes, definitely working with you. Yeah, those are close, close relationships. Bullies. Yeah, absolutely. Adversity. Yes. And love. Absolutely. And your experience. Yes, your experience. Absolutely. So all of these great answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So all of these things influence who we are today. Now, if we look at our life, tragic accident. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. State of mind. Okay, great. Okay, you can stop. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Very good. Excellent answers. So now if we look at our lives in terms of time, what shaped us in terms of who we are right now in the present moment, all of these things that happened to us, what period of time did they occur? Did they occur in the past, the present, or the future? Well, they all occurred in the past. All of those things occurred in the past. That's where they all occurred. So if we look, we can start to see that who we are today is shaped by our past. But logically, there's something that we have to think about. The past is in the past. And there's nothing we can do to change the past. Make sense? Yeah, it's absolutely logical. Now, if your life today in the present moment is shaped by your past, but the past is in the past and there's nothing that you can do to change the past, then who you are in the present moment can't be changed. Now, that's a logical argument, but it doesn't sit well, does it? Not, not at all. So it turns out that it's not actually the case that who you are in the present moment is dictated by your past. So I want to suggest a radical idea, a radical notion that I learned from one of my many gurus, actually several gurus, that who you are in the present moment is actually not dictated by what happened in your past. It's actually shaped by the future that you're living into. But it looks like the past is influencing who you are in the present. And there's a reason for that. So here's what happened. So I'll give you a story. I was working in hospital administration. And I had just taken the hospital through its first accreditation with me. We did so much work. It was awesome. And then it was about two weeks later. We hadn't received the results yet. And then I get a phone call from my boss, Vivian. She calls me up and she says, Ruben, be in my office in five minutes. Click. Now, how many of you have ever had that visceral feeling come through your body when you're just filled with dread and fear? Anybody? That went through my body like, oh, no. That tone in her voice told me it's over. Oh, no. I'm racing in my head with all kinds of thoughts. The monkey took over. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to get a new job. I'm going to have to rebuild my resume. I mean, all of this stuff went in my head. It was the longest five minutes of my life. And then I walked down the hallway. Knock on the door. Vivian says, come in. That tone of voice again. Oh my God, I'm just, ugh. I walk in, close the door. She says, sit down. 
And she looks at me and she says, Ruben, I just want you to know you did a hell of a great job on the accreditation. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm waiting for it. When's it coming? When's, when's the shoe going to drop, right? And she said, and I'm thinking, oh, here it comes. Since you're my quality manager, I have to send you to the quality managers conference in Hawaii next month. I hate you. Get the hell out of my office. Bye. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So where, where I was in that five minutes, in that present, that when I was in that moment was dictated by my dread, my anxiety, my fear of what was going to happen when I got to Vivian's office. But the future looks a lot like the past. And here's what, what we do as human beings. When things happen to us, some of you even said like a tragic accident, love, adversity, bullies, influenced by your mentors, significant emotional events. Okay, you have things that happen to you. And then you said to yourself these famous words or some version thereof, I'll never do that again. How many of you have ever said that? Mm -hmm. So things happen in the past. I'll never do that again. What do we do with that this decision? We move it over here into the future, preparing us in case a similar experience or similar situation, similar conditions arise. And we do that over and over again and again and again and again. And we start to prepare ourselves for the circumstances that might be similar to what we experienced in our past. And this is what we do as human beings. We program ourselves to be prepared for survival. And we do this over and over and over and over and over and over. And most of us don't realize most of this actually got set up before the age of seven. Woo! You don't even remember that. I don't. So knowing that this happens, that we actually program our future, based on the experiences that we had on our past, just knowing that makes no difference. What we have to be able to do is actually remove the constraints of our future, not the good stuff, but the constraints of our future that we, that, uh, that uh, excuse me, that are placed in there from our past decisions. So we have to remove that. We have to clear out the future and put the past back in the past where it belongs. And if we do that, we get this. We get a future that is completely free and wide open and unencumbered by the constraints of our past. This is what we're going to step into today to begin this process of being able to clear out the constraints of our past and our subconscious mind that are programmed to basically limit our future. There are many models to help us understand how we actually do this in psychology. Many models from understanding this. So how do we create the results that, that we have in our lives? This is a model. There are many models, but this one is really seems to resonate for me in many situations. Consider what happens to us is that events occur in our lives. And events will happen, circumstance will happen. And what we do in our brain almost immediately is we create an interpretation of that event. It's our interpretation. And we have a part of our brain called the, the brain stem and it's got the reticular activating system. And we actually go through and we actually create our interpretation. It's interesting because we've actually seen so many examples of this. For instance, if there's a traffic accident and an intersection and the police interview 
eight people from different locations in that intersection, guess what? They'll get eight different stories. That's nothing. There's there, Nobody's lying. That's just their interpretation. Now, here's the next thing that we do with that story, that interpretation. We then match it up and pull out. We say, okay, this particular circumstance. Now, what are my beliefs that correspond with this circumstance, with this situation? So we look, and, and I, I date myself, but I used to go to the library and actually go to the card catalog system. You remember that? <laughs> well, guess what our brain has? A big card catalog system called beliefs, and it's filled with beliefs. So we pull out all the corresponding cards, like here are the beliefs that correspond with this situation, this, 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 this. We pull them all out. Now, sitting inside our brain is... Sometimes I refer to it as Sister Mary Lenore, but it's, but it's a judge. So we have an internal judge, okay? And this judge is going to look at the evidence mm -hmm, and compare and then assess and then come up with a judgment and a sentence. Mm. Now, this happens in the drop of a hat. Woo. Just going to happen. And we're conditioned this way. Now, based on the sentence, what we do is we go ahead and we have a toolbox of strategies, a toolbox. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I've collected a lot of tools over the years. <laughs> and as a guy, I've actually gone to, I've gone to Home Depot or Lowe's and I've actually purchased tools that I only used once. <laughs> and I still have those tools. So the thing is, we all do that. We collect tools over the course of our lives. And we collect tools for how we're going to actually deal with life. Those become our strategies. Now, some of them are not so useful, but they help us to survive. So we'll use these strategies, we'll collect these strategies, but some of these strategies we'll use more frequently. We'll use them repetitively. Those strategies will become our habits. Now, there's a phrase in psychology, it's very powerful to understand this. Habits produce results. It's true about everything. If you wanted to build stronger, a stronger body, you'd have to have the habits of working out and training your body. If you wanted to be a champion swimmer, you have to have the habit of going to practice and training. If you wanted to be a better basketball player, you have to go have the habits of going to practice and shooting baskets. You have to have the habits. You can't just show up one day and expect it to be, cause miracles. It's not going to happen. So habits produce results. So in order for us to understand how this whole mechanism gets set up, we need to understand all of this, all of the process. Now, you, can't, you cannot change the events, and you're probably not going to be able to change the story yet, just yet. But what we're gonna start off today by looking at just one aspect that really helps you to get a very powerful inkling into how you're wired. We're gonna look at your strategies today, okay? So we're gonna look at your strategies. Now we've got lots of them, all of us do, all of us do, all right? Some people have the strategy of pointing the finger of blame. It's not my fault, not my fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. People do that all the time, you know that. Another strategy, one person's yelling and screaming. The other one matches them. <laughs> Is anybody listening? No. Okay. Another strategy. Well, if no, you're not going to listen to me, let's just put on the gloves and duke it out. We fight over it. Oh, my God. Oh, it's nasty. And then another strategy. Let's just roll out the tanks. I'm, I'm going to go to war with you. And in the history of this world, it is actually sad that people have gone to war simply over differences in beliefs. In psychology, that's considered insanity. It's total insanity because we've all got different beliefs. Every single one of us. It's not worth killing another human being simply because they believe different than you do. Makes no sense. None whatsoever. Now, today you're going to get an opportunity to actually tell yourself the truth about yourself. 
You're going to get an honest look at yourself and look at all the strategies that you've ever practiced, ever in your life. There are 77 on the list. Now, if you have the list, if you have the sheet of paper, go ahead and take the sheet of paper out. Now, here's your assignment. Here's what you need to do. If you didn't get the list, I'm going to show it to you right now anyway. Oh, I'm prepared. <laughs> you cannot escape this process. All right. So now <clears throat> here's how this works. If you have the sheet of paper, put a circle around the number of any of these strategies that you have ever done in your entire life your entire life. For those of you who are getting this only online, all right, write down the number real quick and then you're gonna get this list. So write down and just cryptic very quickly. So this is one half of the list on the screen right now. So go ahead, if you've ever done any of these, you have to claim it, you have to own it and claim it before you can change it. All right, so if you've ever done any of these, make a note of this right now, I'll give you a minute. Two, maybe two. And even if you just identify a few, that's fine. No need to be perfect about this. Just tell the truth. Yeah, I've done that. Oh, I've done that too. Oh, yeah. I still do that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you one more minute. And we'll move to the next, next slide. And by the way, you may have your own that are not on the list. That's okay. If it's really juicy, let me know because I'll add it to the list. <laughs> That's how the list has grown over the years. <laughs> okay, here's the second half of the list. All right, total of 77. So again, you've got to own it and claim it before you can change it. So claim the ones, the habits, the strategies that you've ever committed in your entire life. couple minutes here. Okay, very good. Now, here's the next part of the exercise. Take your full list and identify your top three nastiest strategies that have 
that are still going on in your life, you notice they still happen from time to time, your top three most egregious, nastiest, uh, most impactful strategies in your life. To pick those top three and then write them in the chat window. By the way, everything that we share here stays here. It's just like Las Vegas. Okay. Okay. And then write your top three, your top three in the chat window. This is your opportunity to come clean and tell the truth. Everybody can, everybody is going to do this. Tell the truth. I love your comment, Michael. It's like living in a predictable future. Yes, it is. It is. Absolutely. We live that way. And this is what gets in the way. These strategies get in the way. It's part of what's in the way. All right. So figure out your top three and write them in the chat window. Okay, make fun of others, junk food, analyze, great sharing. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Trivial, trivializing with humor, mm -hmm. working compulsively, isolate, Work, workaholism, eat even when not hungry, mm, powerful, self-doubt, anger, analyze, only three, yeah. <laughs> Being highly critical, blaming others, resent, procrastinate, fantasize, agree to forget about it, feel criticized, blame, shame, guilt, highly critical, mm. eat, rationalize, be critical, intellectualizing, got it, being highly critical, keep it going, people, this is great, great stuff, awesome, keep it going, keep it going. I wouldn't mind to have exercising as an escape or cleaning the house. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you start to notice these things and you go like, why didn't I get those? <laughs> but you can, we can rewire, rewire that. Hearing only what I want to hear. Yes. Okay, really powerful. Agree with Rochelle. <laughs> really great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, very good. Very, very good. All right. Endless explaining. Oh, I love that one. Okay, great. Okay. So now, very good. Well, I'm going to pause here. So here's what we have to get. This is very, very powerful to understand. Consider this. We're all wired. I'm going to explain how we get wired in a little bit. But we're all wired to do these things. And we don't do them intentionally. We do them subconsciously. I'm gonna explain how that all came about, but we're gonna understand this. The thing is, our wiring is so hardwired to do all of these things, many of these things that we just revealed. And we do it even though we may have the nicest personality, but deep down we're nasty. I'm not saying that you're a nasty person, you have a nasty personality. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we have the subconscious that is nasty. We do things for ourselves. We're very self-centered in our subconscious mind. Our subconscious mind is like a little child, very selfish and self-centered. It is. It's just how it is wired. So now if you have the bigger worksheet, so by the way, you can tell your friends, I'm nasty. Okay, you can do that. <laughs> you can tell your friends you're nasty and they'll look at you a little different. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, we're all nasty, every single one of us. So now get your big worksheet out. And I want you to answer these three questions. All right, so these three questions. Where have you struggled with self-sabotage? Any area of your life, whether it's your health, your finances, relationships, work, um, 
fitness, whatever area in your life that you know that you, if you could actually have a breakthrough in that area, that would make a huge difference to you. I don't care what it is, whether it's your sleep, anything, anything at all, any area, where have you struggled with self-sabotage? Because you've been doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. Okay. That's where you've struggled. Now, Figure that one area out, just one area for today, just one. We're just going to focus on one. I promise you it's going to affect every area of your life where there's self-sabotage. Then look at those strategies in, that you identified already. Which of those strategies have been at play in that particular area of struggle? It may be part of your top three. It may be others. Which, which of the strategies that you identify have been at play when it comes to this struggle, this area of struggle? And then how long has it been this way? Off and on, could be a long period of time. Now, none of you are... <laughs> None of you are as old as forever, so you can't say forever, okay? You're not that old. So how long has it been this way for you? It could be since childhood. It could be since, you know, five years. Could be 11 years. Could be 23 years, whatever. Pick a number, whatever it is. And then go ahead and write your answers in the chat window so I can, I can see where you're, where you're working. Okay, where have you struggled with self-sabotage? What's the area? What strategy, what, name a couple of strategies that have contributed to that, to that struggle. And then how long has it been this way? So, right, fast. Go ahead, go to it, go to it. Share in the chat window. Remember, it all stays here. Work injustices. Used to have I used to have resent, resentment as the number one, but radical forgiveness changed that. Thankfully, it went on for 30 years. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Who else? Who else? Thank you for sharing that, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah, powerful stuff. Who else? Who else? Keep it going. Keep it going. Struggle, poor image of myself. Got it. Strategy, self-criticism, 30 plus years. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. Yeah, Rochelle, area of bad eating, strategies that contributed. That's all I know. Since five years old. Mm, got it. Okay. Most of I've used humor to cope. It's, it's bad and good at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got that, Laura. Okay. Yeah, most of your life. Okay. Couple more. Struggle finances, okay? And what's the strategy there, Robin? What's the strategy that you've been using that's contributed to that struggle? And then how long has it been that way? Being too nice, mm, blaming, well, resentment. I'm still working on it. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay, so really, thank you, those of you who share. Thank you, thank you. By the way, when you share, I promise you'll have the biggest breakthroughs. That's my promise. It happens all the time. All right, let's see. One family member being uh, being too nice, 40 years. Got it. Okay, yeah. Got it, got it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's move on. So now, here's the thing I want you to consider, my friends. Consider... Consider what we do as human beings is when we struggle. What we try to do is take action to fix it every now and then. We take action. We try to fix it. We say, oh, maybe this will fix it. Uh, maybe this supplement will fix it. Oh, maybe this pill will fix it. Or maybe this action will take it. We were looking for one cause, one effect. We're looking for a quick fix. And we're trained to think that way. We are. And we all, a lot of us think that way. In fact, traditional medicine thinks that way. <laughs> okay. So the thing is, I learned that. I mean, that's how we are trained to think. 
And then what happens is that we get to a point where we try and we fail. We try and we fail. And we try and we fail. And we keep doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. Which is the definition of, as Einstein so elegantly put it, that's insanity. And so if we continue to do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten before. So we keep getting this, this process of insanity. Now, I'm not saying that you're clinically insane. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> However, I'm saying that we have this insidious insanity that we all have. And it's not because you are insane, there's something wrong with you. No, it's just your subconscious programming. Now, you do know some people, however, they do love their insanity. You know that because when they call you, you think twice before answering the phone. Because, quite frankly, they don't suffer from insanity. They enjoy every moment of it. You know who they are. So in order to change and address this insanity, now, by the way, I have to ask a question. How many of you are ready to end the insanity? Raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. Ready to end this ins insidious insanity. Okay, great. Now, we need a radical and different approach. Again, I turn to Einstein. Brilliantly, who said this, that the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. This is so powerful, let that sink in. The significant, the big, the major problems that we face cannot be solved, it can't be solved. At the same level of thinking we were at when, guess what, we created them. Now we didn't create them intentionally, we created them subconsciously. Now, this is powerful to understand. I shared it with you my story of what I realized that I had created my own problem of being overweight and unhealthy. I had to realize that I had created my problem. I had to take complete responsibility for the fact that I had created my own problem, not intentionally, but subconsciously. So it's no sense playing the blame, shame, guilt game. That doesn't work. It doesn't help. There's nothing wrong with me or any of you. I had to learn to recognize that I had done it subconsciously and I had to take responsibility for it. And I had to be willing to start to move in the right direction. Again, I didn't have any training in understanding the subconscious mind until after graduate school. And I started learning about how we rewire the subconscious mind. One of my favorite teachers, Dr. Bruce Lipton, he wrote The Biology of Belief. Fabulous researcher, amazing. And he said this, that 95% of our life is coming from the subconscious programs of how to live life that we get in the first seven years of life. And there's a reason for this, because in the first seven years of our lives, our brain is actually operating on a different frequency called theta. Now, as adults, we don't really pay attention, but we actually step into the theta frequency just as we're starting to wake up and as we're in that twilight of light sleep. That's when we're in theta. As children, we're in theta all the time. And theta is the same frequency as hypnosis. Now, if you have little children, children or have had little children, you may recognize that they are operating in a hypnotic trance the entire time, aren't they? <laughs> they're emotional. They're not rational at all. At all. So in our first seven years of our lives, how we learn about life is we actually download everything that we see, hear, feel, taste, touch, and smell, and experience. We download it all, 100% perfect recording machine. Everything is recorded. Now, it's imperfect recall, because usually most of us don't remember very much from before the age of seven. Every, a few events here and there. Now, here's what happens. 
we get to be an adult and we wake up and we open our brain like a laptop computer. Open it up, there it is. And on that laptop, there you see all the icons of all the different software programs that have been programmed in. Here's a program for breakfast. Here's a program for work. Here's a program for um, your friends. Here's a program for your relationships. Here, here's a program for dinner. Here's a program for all these different things. And all we do is we go back and forth between these programs every day, all day long. And we never even stop and think, how did these programs get there? And more importantly, how do I change them? And when something goes wrong in the program, what do I do? There's no tech support. <laughs> so we're in trouble. Today, you're getting tech support. <laughs> okay? So the thing about it is that if we are aware, we start to realize, oh, my God, I'm just using these same programs over and over again, expecting different results. I'm insane, but not clinically. So we have to learn how to reprogram the subconscious mind. We start to recognize something very important, as Bruce Lipton also said. Are we running our lives with conscious mind? Or are we running our lives with the subconscious programs? Hmm. Well, science has revealed that only 5% of the day are we operating our nervous system using the conscious mind's creative wishes and desires. 95% of the day, our life is coming straight out of the programs in our subconscious. So you can have all the positive thinking you can think of in the world, but if you don't address the subconscious mind, nothing's going to change. Mm. This is powerful to understand this. It really is. It's pretty amazing. It makes such a profound difference because our subconscious mind is the crux of the matter. It records everything 100%. It is always alert and awake. It controls 95% of your life. It's built on habituation and repetition. It speaks to you in your dreams and it has no verbal language. It takes everything literally, just like a little child, right? And it can do a trillion things all at once. It's not logical at all. It is the feeling, emotional mind. And it's one million times more powerful than the conscious mind. So our mission, if we're really going to transform our lives, if we're really going to end the self-sabotage, we have to understand the subconscious mind. So what we're going to step into next is understanding your subconscious map. You have a map. I'm going to give you the map. We have to understand the map of how your subconscious operates. Now, remember, this is the feeling mind, not the rational mind. So we're going to go through this together. Now, a word of warning before we start. And that is this. If you hold on to what you know, that will be limiting, okay? Let it go, let it go. Now, beliefs, remember that? Don't believe anything that I say. Don't get caught up in your beliefs. In fact, don't believe anything you say either. <laughs> don't get stuck in your beliefs. And then stay in a beginner's mind, what we call a Zen mind, a beginner's mind. Be open, receptive. Now, you may notice Lots of different emotions that come up as a result of this process. Be okay with it. Please don't take it personally and please don't take it out on me. Okay? I'm just the messenger. So just notice these things that come up. It's all part of the process. It's perfectly normal. It's nothing personal. Just let it flow. Just let it flow. So my model for understanding how the subconscious mind works based on so many wonderful teachers that I've learned from is an iceberg. The subconscious mind is like an iceberg. And this is where the self-sabotage mechanism resides, is in our subconscious mind. Now, like an iceberg, there's very little of it that is actually above the surface. Most of the iceberg is below the surface, underwater, and you don't even see it. But that's what actually sunk the Titanic. So this is what does this in, is what's underneath the surface of the water. So the first level of this mechanism is what we are aware of. 
the conversations that we say to ourselves in the moment of truth, when we are in the process of sabotaging ourselves again. So I want you to focus on that area that you chose to work on for today. So in that moment of truth, when you are about to sabotage yourself again, okay, just play the tape back, okay? Now, in that moment, what is it that you said to yourself when you choose to do what you know you shouldn't do? What have you said to yourself in that moment of truth? Dieting sucks. I want ice cream now. <laughs> I've worked so hard. I deserve that cookie. Okay. Whatever it is, go ahead and write that in the chat window. Write a couple of them down. What are some of the things that you said to you that you have said to yourself in the moment of truth when you are about to sabotage yourself? I deserve it. Got it. Let's get a few more in here. Come on. You know, play the tape back. What's that monkey told you in that moment of truth? Okay, that monkey goes wild. Okay. One cookie won't hurt. Love it. A little won't hurt. Yep. Mm hmm. I'll never change. Oh, it's okay. I won't do it next time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. Really great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That's great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. So be at work at this. Really be aware. What is it that you've been saying to yourself in that moment of truth? You're about to sabotage yourself again. Okay. So make sure you've got it on your sheet. Now what we're going to do is go under the surface of the water. Oh, I love this one. I'll make it up. I'll make up for it later by dieting. Oh, love that one. Love it. Love it. Okay. So I want you to now look at your, your sheet, your worksheet, if you have it. So the next thing we're going to do is strap on the scuba tanks. We're going under. Now, here's the thing I want you to do. I want you to feel. I don't want you to think rationally. This is not a rational process at all. It will not make rational sense at all. I want you to feel, connect here with your heart. You know, you feel it, okay? So we're gonna put on the tanks, we're going under. So what contributes to these conversations that we're aware of at the surface? Are, there, are these deeper, what we call primary conversations? These are early age conversations. They arise early in our childhood. When we start to develop language, usually year and a half, two, two and a half, somewhere in there, we start to develop language. And one of the first things that we learn, if you've been around children at all, I have four, <laughs> you start to realize that they start learning survival language. We all learn this. We all learn survival language when we're young. Now, sometimes we don't even have to say a word. You know this. What we do is we project. We project. How many of you can tell what somebody's thinking just by looking at them in the moment? <laughs> right? We project what we're thinking sometimes. I'm not talented enough, not smart enough. I'm not good enough, not, not pretty enough, not good enough, not smart enough. I mean, we project things. Okay, we can read people a lot of times. So here's a list of some primary conversations, some of the most predominant conversations that I've collected over the years and being able and doing this work, okay? Now, here's what I want you to do. Circle any of these that resonate with your little child, your inner child, your two-year-old, your three-year-old, okay, over here on the right, okay? Money, I want it. I'm not getting what I want. There's not enough. I need more. No, I don't want to. It's not fair. Shouldn't be this way. I have to be good. I've been good. I deserve it. I hate you. I can't trust you. I'm not good enough. Never me. I'm bad. I've been bad. I'm wrong. It's my fault. I'm weak. I don't matter. I'm not important to you. Why bother? I give up. I'm in danger. I'm helpless. Okay, whatever's there for your inner child, don't think, just feel. 
go ahead and circle whichever ones apply to you. Whatever is there for you. This is unique. This is your map. It's yours, it's not anybody else's. Okay. Okay, let's have a few of you put what you discovered in your, what you discovered, what was there for you? A few of you put it in the chat window. What's there for you? Just a few. Let's have some of you put it in the chat window. I don't matter. I'm not loved. I'm unwanted. Got it. Poor sleep harming self sabotaging. Self-talk. I am a failure. Got that. I'm weak. I'm not good enough. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Couple more. Who else? Who else? What do you notice? These are prevalent. These are the primary conversations. I hate you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Diane. Yeah. It's not fair. I'm bad. Yeah. Really great. Thank you for sharing that, Rochelle, Laura, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being really vulnerable and open about this. Okay. I don't matter. It's not fair. I'm helpless. Very good. So let's pause here. Very good. So these are the things that we we have in our wiring. These are there. They're embedded. So now what we need to do is we need to go deeper. What keeps these primary conversations alive are what we call subconscious payoffs. Our inner child is actually getting a benefit from saying these things to ourselves. Doesn't sound rational at all. I told you it's not. It's not rational at all. So there's a payoff, there's a, there's a, there's a, a benefit. It's not, it's, it's not a very good benefit, but it's a it's subconscious benefit. And so we have these payoffs. Now, I love some of the movies that portray this so well, really, really well. I, I got in the habit of reading many of the fairy tales to my boys when they were little that really portrayed some of this as well. So fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales are really excellent at being able to sh showcase these payoffs. But I also love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> Willy Wonka, Alice in Wonderland. There's many others, okay? Wonderful stories, wonderful. So here are some of the payoffs. Now, again, I want you to feel, don't think, feel. Which of these apply to your inner child? So you have to be two-headed about this. All right, so what applies to your inner child? One is immediate gratification. I want it, I want it now, get it to me, give it to me now. Another is comfort, pleasure, and laziness. Okay, we love to feel good. Another justification, another payoff is reasons and justifications. These are emotional, not rational. Okay, they're emotional. Okay, I, I remember asking my son Gabriel when he was little, why did you hit your brother? And he, and he said, because. <laughs> I, I said, no, Gabriel, what did Joseph do that made you hit him? He said, well, he looked at me funny, so I hit him. Not logical. And then blame, shame, guilt. Ooh, this is a big payoff for a lot of us. All right, really is. We play that this card all the time of blame, shame, guilt, not only on others, but also on ourselves. And then another card is a two-sided card, which is being right versus being wrong. If I'm right, everybody else is wrong. If they're right, I'm wrong. So we play both sides of that card. Another card for a payoff card is superiority versus inferiority. If I'm superior, everybody else is inferior. If they're superior, then I'm inferior. I don't matter. Another card, another payoff card is control versus no control or chaos. All right? Control. This is my sandbox. These are my toys and these are my rules. How we play here. We know people like that, right? And then versus no control. I just need to be spontaneous. I need to be free. I need to do whatever moves me in the moment. Okay. So we play both sides of that card. The ultimate payoff for all of us as human beings is avoiding responsibility. We avoid it. I'll get to it later. I'll put it off. And it's basically like being Peter Pan. I don't want to grow up. No, 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 no. So again, circle. Which of these resonate with your inner child? Do it now.
Now, we're going to go deeper because these payoffs stay in place because we actually have a character role that we're playing in our lives. As little children, what we learn to do is to adapt to survival situations by playing a particular character. We learn to do that. A friend of mine who's a child psychiatrist, we talked about how she interviewed young children and she said what we had to do was engage in play in order to interview young children because they're too small to actually rationally answer rational questions. Can't do it. So we learn to adapt to difficult situations by, by adopting a survival role. Now, you know this today. Be honest with yourself. Do you act differently when you go home for the holidays with certain people in your family? Hmm. Most of us do. Most of us have a particular coat of armor that we put on. We protect ourselves. We act a particular way when we're around certain people. That is a survival role. Put a fence up some more to jump. It's got to be a little bit worried. They say, can't wait for eight foot in front, three in the side. You can mute. You can mute, please. Please mute. Oh, what's it? You can't have anything on. Eight feet to the front of that green box. There we go. Or three foot to the side of it. So I was going to start the fence right around the corner of it. Well, that's not going to work. Okay, somebody's not muted. I need to mute. Okay. Yeah, it down. Mute all. Uh, okay, I hit mute all. Somebody's still not muted. Mary Pat. Oh, mute. Thank you. Okay, got it. Okay, very good. All right, then. All right, so now here's what happens we adopt. And we sometimes can adopt several roles, several different roles for survival. So here's a whole list, a whole list of potential roles that we can adopt. And we can adopt several of them, not just one. But the victim says, there's no hope for me. Again, I want you to feel, 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 feel. The victim says, there's no hope for me. This is, it's hopeless. The martyr says, you're important. I'm not. I don't matter. The rescuer says, I'll save you even if I have to die in the process. The rebel says, it's my way or the highway. Do what I tell you or get out. The jester who de depersonalizes through laughter, the funny guy or the funny gal. The cynic who says, no way, you're wrong, that'll never work. The ostrich who buries their head in the sand and says, problem? What problem? I don't see a problem. There's no problem. The masochist who says, I've been bad, punish me. The sadist who says, you've been bad, I'm going to punish you. The narcissist who says, I am the center of the universe. You need to take care of me. It's all about me. Then the entitled person who says, I've been really good. I deserve it. And then the peacekeeper who says, can't we all just get along? Let's not fight. Then the people pleaser who says, I'll do anything to make, make you love me. And the flip side of that one is the people user. I'll use anyone and to get what I want, what I need. So you could be playing several roles and, diff several role and different roles in different situations. So again, circle which ones resonate with you. Make a note of it now. Do it now. I'll give you a minute. Don't feel embarrassed, Letitia. This is how we all are as human beings. We're all wired these ways. We, this is what we all have, every single one of us, okay? We're all this way. The, the powerful part is when you start to actually learn this. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. Okay, it may seem strange or weird, whatever the case may be. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Remember, this is not rational at all. So now, let's go down to the final level. What drives this whole process, this whole mechanism of self-sabotage, the entire subconscious mind in the survival state is fear. Our fears drive everything. Our fears are the only thing that hold us back from accomplishing our dreams. We all have dreams, but what gets in the way are our fears. And we learn to be afraid. We learn. We're conditioned to be afraid. And we learn to be afraid at a very young age. Now, some of the fears are perfectly legitimate. They're, they're, they're really quite useful. It's, you don't want to run out in, on the freeway in the middle of fast-moving traffic. That is, that is a legitimate fear. Don't do that. You don't want to touch the stove while it's piping red hot. No, don't do that. That's a legitimate fear. But many fears that we develop early in our life don't serve us. They don't serve us as adults. So some of the major fears, and there are many, many fears, but here's a list of some of the major fears. So we're, a fear of rejection. We learn to be afraid of being excluded and not being included. We want to belong. Another fear is a fear of failure. We don't want to disappoint our parents. We don't want to look bad. We're afraid of looking bad and not looking good. Another fear is the fear of success. We're afraid of doing well and losing out on being able to play, <laughs> do the things that we love. We're afraid of the unknown, of stepping into uncharted territory. And we'll ask lots and lots and lots of questions. We're afraid of being uncomfortable because we get very conditioned to being comfortable. We got our favorite pillow, our favorite blanket, our favorite chair, our favorite channels. We're very comfortable being comfortable. We're afraid of being hurt. We're afraid of pain. We've been hurt before. We don't want to be hurt again. We're afraid of loss. We've lost things or people that we love. We've gotten very attached to them. And it's very painful when we lose them. And we're afraid of being responsible. We don't want to grow up. We're like Peter Pan. So we just want somebody else to take care of us. So again, circle which of these resonate with you. Take a moment. And then look even deeper. So Dr. Amy Silver, she talks about how fear is a painful feeling that usually prompts us to avoid the cause. So think about how you operate in your life even currently. Okay, do you notice that you're afraid of speaking up? We're afraid of not speaking up. Afraid of being rejected socially of being rejected professionally, afraid of not being noticed or of being noticed, afraid of saying the wrong thing or of showing weakness, afraid of trusting others or building meaningful relationships, afraid of being alone and being unloved. It's a big one. Sh afraid of showing strength or doing things differently or taking risks, afraid of losing control or being in control, afraid of being shouted at or being dominated by others, afraid of shining too bright or of showing others up. So again, 
circle any of these that resonate with your inner child, your inner child, whatever is there for you. And then in the chat window, put one fear, one major fear that you realize is really prominent for you. What's one fear? I know there might be several, but just one, just write in one. What's one fear that's there for you? Major fear. Put that in the chat window. Being alone, speaking up, being noticed that I'm not who I present, speaking up, speaking up. Yeah, yeah. Being shouted at, abandoned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing. Powerful. Speaking up and being rejected. Yeah. Powerful to understand this. Really great. Good work, everybody. This is great. Really, really great. Now, going back to Carl Jung, one of the founders of modern psychology, and he said this. Where your fear is, there your task is. Where your fear is, there your task is. Consider that we're all conditioned to believe what we believe that makes us afraid. Fears are merely beliefs. They are thoughts trusted to be true. They are strongly held opinions, but they are illusions. They are not the truth. They are not the truth. We're conditioned to feel afraid. Just like people were afraid of sailing, they tried to tell Columbus, no, you're going to fall off the edge of the, of, the, of the world. But he conquered that fear and he sailed to the Americas. So consider that you have a pattern that's driven by fear. So I want you to examine this. And if you have your worksheet, you want to look at all the things that you've circled everything that you've looked at, all the different levels, all the different layers. This is your map. And it's a mechanism. And it's just like gears in a clock. The old kind. It's like gears in a machine. It's very mechanical. Okay. Leticia, you're going you're gonna to get the email. I, I sent it to everybody who, who registered within 20 minutes of, of the webinar. So you'll get it later. So don't worry, you'll get it. So the thing about this mechanism that you have, this is you. This is a map of your subconscious mind. Now, we don't need to analyze how it happened. Psychoanalysis is a waste of time. You don't need to sit in a therapist's office and go over this for hours on end, ex having you explain to your therapist about your childhood. Forget it. It's not worth your time or your money. Now, I'm a behavioral psychologist, completely different. I'm out to empower you to change your behavior so you create a new future. You with me? You with me on that? Say yes, okay? <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to actually look. I want you to just examine this whole process. You're just going to get grounded in the reality. <clears throat> you have this. You have this mechanism. You can't, there's no blame, there's no shame, there's no guilt, but you've got to take responsibility for it. This is how you've been wired. Okay? It's just how you've been wired. Nothing bad or wrong about this at all. It's just what is. It's just what is. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your teachers. Don't blame anybody about this. Don't blame yourself. It's just your wiring. Now, there's an effect of this mechanism. 
And I want you to get grounded on this, okay? So I want you to look for a moment. There's an impact of this mechanism. What have you lost out on as a result of this mechanism? What's been the toll? What have been some of the setbacks? What have been some of the drawbacks? What have you lost out on? Go ahead and put that in the chat window, okay? Just put in one or two things, that's it. What has this mechanism hindered you from? Hindrance of connecting at an emotional level with others. Thank you, thank you, absolutely. What else? It's cost you in terms of your health, your happiness, your relationships, your work, your vitality. 10 years of life, got it, yeah. Okay, I, I, isolated times. Yeah, absolutely, got it, yeah. There's a cost. Relationship, advancing at work, health and happiness. Yes, it's costly. This mechanism absolutely prevents you and ho holds you back. It has, it has all these years. It absolutely has. Thank you all for sharing, powerful. Now, here's the deal. Knowing this makes no difference. Peace of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. Knowing this mechanism exists makes no difference. You have a choice now. So earlier I asked you if you were ready to end the insidious insanity in your life. And you said yes. Remember that? Now, I learned this from one of my fav favorite teachers, Jim Rohn. He said, for everything in life, we have one of two choices of two price tags we must pay. We must pay one of these two price tags. So we have a choice between these two choices. For everything in life, either it's the pain of regret or it's the joy from commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, you already said you were ready to end the insanity. That means the pain of regret is now off the table. You have one choice left. Don't you love how I did that to you? <laughs> Set you up. So you have one choice left, the joy from commitment. Now, commitment is defined as a dedication to the long-term course of action. It's discipline. It requires discipline. So now we're going to go through a little experience to help you actually step into the joy from commitment, because this is not something that you're used to doing. The joy from commitment, no kidding. Now, I draw on one of my favorite bands of all time, maybe yours. <clears throat> one of my favorite groups is the Beatles. You like the Beatles? I hope you do. All right, so sing along with me. We all live in a yellow submarine, yellow submarine, yellow submarine. We all live in a yellow submarine. Yellow submarine, yellow submarine. So now here is your yellow submarine. You're in the yellow submarine. There you are on the periscope. That's actually Margaret Thatcher, but just imagine it's you. All right, you're on the periscope. Now you have been ramming up against this iceberg over and over and over again. Your entire life, you've been butting up against it because you didn't have a periscope. Now you have the periscope and now you're able to see this iceberg for the first time in your life you see it as it is there it is in your gun sights you see it now it has been blocking you all these years so what are you going to do you're going to blow it up because you got a submarine and you've got torpedoes so we're not all on right now so stay muted for now but i want you to repeat after me Low Torpedo Bay, number one. Low Torpedo Bay, number two. Fire one. Fire two. 
all both torpedoes running true and hot. Captain, count down to impact. Count down with me. Five, four, three, two, one. Coosh. Coosh. Both torpedoes successful. We have detonated the iceberg. It is now crumbling into the ocean, Captain. We are now free to move past this iceberg for the first time in your life. Now that you have to see it first before you can break through it. And now you're able to move. Your yellow submarine is now able to get to this incredible island that you've been wanting to get to, but you didn't even know it was there, but you're now able to get into uncharted territories. You're now able to go to this amazing place called Fantasy Island, where all your dreams come true. Some of you remember the show. Instead of coming by the plane, we're coming by the submarine, okay? <laughs> So now we're in Fantasy Island. And guess what? This is your island. This is your tree. This is your hammock. This is your beach. And anything you want for yourself and your life, you can create. You are free to be the person that is completely unrestricted, unconstrained by your past. The future is bright right now. So you get to declare who you choose to be on Fantasy Island, where all your dreams come true. Anything is possible here. So create an affirmation, assertion, and intention statement. It's a declaration. We just celebrated two days ago, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. July 4th, 1776, the United States of America was not in existence. It didn't exist. But that's the birthday of our country. And if you read the Declaration of Independence, it is rather profound. We declare, the last paragraph, we declare that these colonies ought to be free and independent states. And to that cause, we commit our lives, our honors, and our fortunes. Wow. That's an aff affirmation, assertion, and intention statement. No kidding. And by the way, they did commit all that. It's amazing. 56 people signed that document. So I want you to come up with some statements for you to now declare your independence of your subconscious wiring. Here's some examples. Use these words. Here are words for you to help you. Okay, on the left side, there's a whole bunch. On the right side, I'm happy, healthy, wealthy, secure, worthy, positive, blessed, grateful, beautiful, confident, courageous, excited about today, and love. Whatever works for you, pick three powerful words for you to step into. You're choosing this now. You're declaring this now for yourself and your life. What is it that you choose? You get to create your life. You are completely responsible for your health, your happiness, and your life. What do you choose now? If nothing holds you back, we're, we're going to hold you back ever again. Who would you be? So now, write those three words in the chat window. I am joyful. I am happy. I am loved. Love it. I am courageous. Loved and love. Yes. Love it. Keep going, people. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Feed me. Feed me. Feed me. Come on. Let's go. Let it rip. I am happy. Love it. Simple enough. Yes. Yes. Keep it going. Keep it going. I'm healthy, connected, someone who completes things. Love it. Worthy, disciplined, motivated. Yes. I am loved. Yes. Keep it going. Keep it going. 
Come on, some of you are holding up, holding out on me. I am excited about today. Yes, love it, love it, love it. Great. Great. I am whole, perfect, and complete. Oh, one of my favorites. X, absolutely wonderful. I am wealthy, talented, and happy. Yes. I am happy, healthy, and confident. Yes. Okay. I am confident, loved, and a learner. Yes. Okay. Really great. Great, great, great. Two more. Come on. I am worthy and being loved. Yes. I have courage to face today. Yes. I am healthy. Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. All of you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll pause here. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. So what we've done, what we have done is that we have wiped off the mirror that has been foggy your entire life. We have wiped it clean. You know how it is when you go to a hotel and you take a shower, hot shower, and then you get out of the shower and the mirror is all foggy. And you take a towel and you wipe it nice and clean. All right, very, very good. It's nice and clean. And so we have wiped the mirror clean. And you can see yourself clearly for the first time. Because now you see yourself, the light and the darkness, you see it all. You see the subconscious wiring. You see it all. Now, here's the news. That you're going to have to do the work of keeping the mirror clean. Because otherwise, the, the mirror will get foggy again. So you have to keep this up. So as I learned from Earl Nightingale many years ago, he said this, that whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourish with repetition and emotion, repetition and emotion, both must be there. Remember, your subconscious mind is wired emotionally with habituation and repetition. Both needs to be there. Now, this is not a mystery. It's not a mystery. You've gone out and cheered for your children. You've been at their athletic events. You yelled and screamed. And guess what? They performed better, didn't they? You had to be there. And you know what it feels like if you've ever had that experience. When you've had your family there and cheering for you and everybody else is there, you had the home court advantage. It, it was amazing. So we have to cheer for ourselves. Most of us don't do this. We have to cheer for ourselves each and every day. It's really important that we do that. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to commit, no kidding, to stating your affirmation as often as possible for at least 30 days in a row and 30 times a day. My rule is 30 times a day for 30 days in a row, minimum, minimum. Now, I've been saying affirmations for years, every morning, every morning. OK, and you need to act consistently with your affirmation as often as possible. And I'm going to send you this amazing video of this little girl over here called Jessica. Her name's Jessica. This is a few years back, but I saw this and I was moved to tears when I saw this. Here's this little girl, probably four or five years old, and she climbs up on the bathroom sink on the vanity on the sink yeah she climbs over the sink straddles the sink standing in front of the mirror and she does this little dance i love my mommy i love my daddy i love my teacher and she's just as cute as can be absolutely adorable but she's so positive it's just incredible to watch her do this little dance and by the end of it i was just moved because i thought to myself how many parents actually empower their children to be able to see themselves in this positive light? I know I didn't get that. I didn't get that growing up. So it's so powerful to be able to do this. So here's your process, four steps, four steps. First step is awareness. Now, we did the process today of looking at your map or your subconscious mind. That's awareness. Now, you're going to need to revisit this over and over again. Second, choose pain of regret or the joy from commitment. Now, if you choose commitment, you're going to need disciplined thinking and speaking. You have to think the right thoughts and speak the right words. And you're going to need disciplined actions. 
rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, okay? This is a lifelong process. You're not going to, going to reach nirvana in two weeks, trust me. <laughs> so you gotta work at this. Now I'm gonna give you one more hack, one more tool, one more tool to work on this. And this is from another one of my favorite teachers, Viktor Frankl, incredibly brilliant physician who survived Auschwitz. And he said this, that between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Powerful. Really powerful to understand this. We always have a choice. We always do. Most of us don't take advantage of that power that we have to pause and to take and take that responsible choice so three words that i want you to remember triggered reacted responded you will be triggered all of us will be you will be triggered things will trigger you that's just your wiring somebody will say something boom you get triggered Somebody will do something, boom, you get triggered. It's true for every single one of us. Now, you have a choice. You have a choice. Listening to Dr. Frankel, you can either react, which is your subconscious automatic wiring, or you can pause and respond consciously. Now, to help you to do this, to help pick one strategy that you want to change, that has been contributing to your, sub, your self-sabotage. And then here's a three by five card. I have had, I'm gonna give you an example of a story that I had. So this is what I did with Jimmy. So Jimmy was somebody who was, was lashing out as, at his employees in the company that he was working at. And the CEO said, either he has to change his attitude and stop lashing out at people or we're gonna to have to let him go. And he's too valuable to let go. So this is really a dilemma for us. So the first exercise I had Jimmy do was to make up a three by five card. The habit to extinguish was speaking when angry. That was his habit to extinguish. So every day he had to put tally marks in these boxes. How many times did he get triggered? Every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then of the times that he got triggered, either he reacted or he responded. This was powerful. The first week, he got triggered 27 times. And because he knew he had to report in with me, he only reacted twice. And those two times were with his younger sons <laughs> at home on the weekend. He did not lash out at work. It's been over a year and a half, and he still has not lashed out at work, not even one time. Complete change, powerful, powerful tools. So I'm I'm going to also send you some information on the books for, by Doc, by uh, Gary John Bishop. Absolutely fantastic books, very good information. I love what his quote quote his here quotes are here. You'll never get over your past until you open your eyes to know to to how you use you've used it to justify yourself. Mm, you never get you'll never get over your past until you. Open your eyes to how you've used it to justify yourself. Powerful, powerful. Whole bunch of more great wisdom from him. Read those three books and then read this book. This will be the fourth book that I read that you want to read. The Illusion of Money, Why Chasing Money is Stopping You from Actually Receiving It. Brilliant author. Fantastic. And there's actually a documentary. I'll send you the information on it, see if you can find it. It's fantastic. The Illusion of Money. Absolutely wonderful. And I love what he said here. So this quote really resonates for me. And that is when we're able to accept and transcend our fears with acceptance and love, instead of obsessing over them, we connect to a higher dimension that allows us to access both internal security and external abundance at the same 
time. It's powerful. Powerful. Now, Lao Tzu said it well. If you are depressed, you are living in the past. Mm. If you are anxious, worried, nervous, you are living in the future. If you are at peace, you are living in the present. My hope for all of you is to be able to live very peacefully. And what I've learned from so many of my teachers is how to actually use all of this. And it's made such an incredible, profound difference in the quality of my life. It's been amazing, been amazing. So now, how many of you would like to make the rest of your life the best of your life? I certainly hope all of you would like to be able to do that. So imagine for a moment, what would that look like for you? Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. So imagine what would that look like for you if you're actually living your best life? Would it be a life filled with vitality and energy and accomplishments and doing things that you love? Would it be that you dancing on the beaches, their favorite beaches on the planet with your loved one and just having a great time filled with health, energy, vitality, and fun? The question is, where are you now? Are you there yet? Hmm. Chances are you're not. So how will you get from where you are now to where you would like to be? Well, just like anything else in life, you need a plan. But do you actually have a plan that's proven to work? A proven plan. Most of us don't have that. I've been very fortunate in my life. I'm very blessed and I'm eternally grateful because I've learned from so many wonderful teachers and I've created a plan that actually is, it works and I'm living proof. So my four steps to actually creating a permanent, thriving, healthy, happy lifestyle change. And this is the mock-up of my book, How to Fully Live. So, so the four steps, this is what my book is all about. Number one is begin from within. We need to rewire the subconscious and change our mindset, our thinking, our attitude, and our consciousness. The game starts here. Second is a proven strategy of how to change our lifestyle. And that's an evidence-based approach using what I've learned from lifestyle medicine. It's amazing. Third, we need to actually develop the consistency of our new habits that will actually produce new results. But then we also need support and accountability. No kidding, we all perform better when we have community. We all do. That helps us to sustain our transformation. So some of my services, I do lifestyle medicine consultations for people to get them started on creating a plan. So I do this with people. I also have my life-changing program. It's my, my uh, actually, it's a how to fully live 12-week lifestyle medicine immersion program. So it's starting July 13th. So coming up next Saturday. So it's coming up next Saturday. It's online. It's going to be awesome. I've got people from all over the country. Even Australia, yes. All right, so people from all over the world are joining us. And one of my, one of my graduates, I thought I'd share with you because this is a program that sets you up to no kidding, create a transformation. So Donna was a, is a retired nurse and she came into my program after having been on a plant-based diet for about eight, nine years. In 2018, she said, Ruben, I still got issues. I've lost about 50 pounds, but I still have arrhythmia. I still have, still have high blood pressure and I still have edema in her leg, my legs. And I also have knee pain. I can hardly even walk. And so she came into the program and she did phenomenal. In fact, she did my program four times and it was phenomenal. She made such incredible transformational pr progress. And then here she was a year and a half later in, in January 2020, 70 pounds lighter, loving her life. And she will tell you she's living her best life. And then, of course, after that, what happened? COVID. Did that stop her? No. She created community. Mm -hmm. She knew the importance of community and she created her own community and they all went walking every day, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 miles a day. Incredible. And then <laughs> Thanksgiving day at the age of 69 in 2021, she en ends up walking a 10K, 10 kilometers in one hour and 41 minutes. She could hardly walk when, she, when I first met her. 
It was amazing. And then two weeks later, she ends up outdoing herself and she walked the entire 26.2 miles of the California International Marathon. Extraordinary. Your, your results might vary. I also do a lifestyle and performance medicine in the workplace. I do programs to help organizations completely transform. And then this is my contact information. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And then I want to leave you with this quote before I open it up for questions. But this is one of my favorite quotes from Hunter S. Thompson, that life is not a journey to the grave with the intention to arrive in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. I don't know about you, but that's how I'm going out. I'm going out just like Bob because that's what I, I help Bob to do. I help Bob who came to me with the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer and the doctors gave him six months to live. And we went to work and changing his lifestyle and they didn't offer a whole lot to Bob as far as medical treatment. So it was 30 months later that he passed away. He beat the odds by 500%. So if you'd like to beat the odds by 500%, just let me know. Okay, so now, Let's see, where am I? So if you want to unmute yourself, if you want to do that and ask questions, please do so. Okay, let me go to gallery so I can see you all. Yay! Okay, questions, comments, insights, ahas, major takeaways, illuminations, revelations, anything at all. You're all on, you're on. Ask a question. Yes, Rochelle. Is fear always bad? Um, can fear work for you? Be, you know, because like if I go to the doctor and get bad news, that motivates me. But it's a shame I had to get that bad with my health mm -hmm. before I got bad news and right. would be scared to do something. Right. So in psychology, we talk about the two most powerful motivators for human behavior are fear and desire. Okay, so the thing is, fear can motivate you. It can, absolutely. All right, when, and, most, and most human beings fail to get motivated until they're at the brink. There's such a significant fear, but it's not sustainable. That's the problem. It's not sustainable. So what we have to do, what I learned from Dr. Deepak Chopra is that we have to be able to transform the fear into desire. We have to move from fear to being positively motivated. And we have to learn, and this is one of the things that I'm going to cover in the program very, very powerfully that I've been added to the program, is understanding what motivates us, what impels us, instead of what compels us. Fear compels us. People say, if you, don't, if you don't raise your productivity, we're going to have to fire you. That's a fear. It's temporary. That works. But that's only short-lived. A really powerful leader will say, I want to know what drives you, what motivates you, what, what makes you tick. What is it that it is, inspires you? The word inspiration. So the word ins inspire comes from the Latin inspire, which means to breathe life into. So what inspires you? We have to move from your fears to what inspires you. Make sense, Rochelle? And it's not good to be, to live in fear. I mean, no, because you, you talk about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Yes. It's right. not, fear is not healthy, I guess, for you. No, it can motivate you. But if you stay in fear, you're going to stay in the sympathetic state. So it's unhealthy long-term. So what we have to do is swing the pendulum from fear to being inspired and having intention and positive desire. We have to have that and love for ourselves. That's what this whole program is all about. Got it? Good. All right. Next question. Bring it on. Bring it on. Who else? Some of you I haven't seen in a long time. Come on. This is Michael. So I, my Michael. question is pretty long. Would you mind reading it? I put it in the chat. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. let's see here. Oh, Thank there you. you If our programs are in the subconscious mind, don't we need to enter that state of mind 
using lower level brain waves like alpha and theta to rewrite these programs to let's see to make permanent change positive affirmations feel like a conscious level beta mechanism almost like positive thinking great question so dr bruce lipton lipton has done tremendous research on this so i'm going to send you his video because he actually talks about this so there are two simple ways to rewire the subconscious mind. Number one is using hypnosis. So we enter into the theta state and then we have actually have a hypnotic suggestion. So a trained hypnotherapist can actually take you through that process. It's expensive, okay? <laughs> so you have to realize that. So that's, that's one, it works really well. But the other way to program the subconscious mind is very inexpensive, but it takes discipline. And that is repetition and emotion. So those two need to be there. I'll give you an example. Now you, did you, do you remember the first day you got behind the wheel of a car? Uh, I mean, I, uh, most boy. people do. You're yeah. 15. Yeah, 15. yeah, 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 yeah. At 15, least the 15. time frame. Yeah, general time frame. Right. Yeah. So you're about that age and you get behind the wheel of the car. Now, do you remember how intensely focused you were? looking at the mirrors, every detail, like every little detail. Now, question, do you still drive that same with that same level of focus? No, it's, it's automatic now. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because your subconscious got programmed by repetition and you got comfortable. And now, isn't it amazing? Have you been driving down the freeway and notice people doing the most unreal things while they're actually driving? And you know, that, and that makes sense to me from the perspective of when you're writing a new program. But it seems like if you have to unwire mm -hmm. and rewire, it seems it seems a little. And I've tried a lot of this already, yeah. and maybe it's just I haven't got a, a good teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about through things like uh, meditation and things where that you can get back, you can recess into those levels and. And that, that type of thing. What do you think about stuff like that? Those are all helpful tools. The, the, and by the way, there are many tools around reprogram, pro, programming the subconscious mind and reprogramming your beliefs. I cover that in my immersion program. All right. So that's the next step. After looking at your subconscious map, we look at, okay, what are some of the tools that you can use to help you to rewire your subconscious mind? So there's many exercises, there's many tools. The most effective to start with is using affirmation, assertion, and intention statements with coupled with emotion. That's the thing that a lot of yeah. people it's missing for them. Absolutely. Like you really have to get to that emotional state. I mean, to me, the emotion and the thinking have to go together, or it just seems like mm -hmm. it's 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 like uh, just a, a, a futile effort to try to change something in the thinking. But if there's no mm -hmm. heightened emotion to go with it, to me, it's just I give up on it. I just absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. So are you, are you, I'm in your area. Do you, are you have a private practice too? I do. Oh, I excellent. Do. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you. <laughs> Sounds good. Not a problem. Right. Not Thank a problem. You. Yeah. Okay. Who else? Who else? Questions. Thank you for that, Michael. Who else? Who else? I have a question. Marie. How, no, um, Merle, no, Merle. Merle. Yeah. Merle. Um, okay, great. How did, I was, how, I, I want more information about your upcoming program. You said it was virtual, so it didn't yes. matter where you were. And so my other question is, um, so I have been trying to get fully plant-based for years and not able to fully do it. I've, I believe in it. I just don't have the skill set to keep doing it. Yeah. Would your program help? Great question. All right. So first question I'm going to answer. My program that's coming up is virtual, so you can do it from anywhere in the world. I even have somebody from Australia participating in the program. So, yes, you can do it. And I have Washington, D.C. I've got Rochelle and I got somebody else. Carolyn Woods is doing the program also from Washington, D.C., Rochelle. So you can do it from anywhere. OK, it doesn't matter. Now, as far as your program, you're struggling with being plant based. We can definitely help you, Merle. Definitely. Okay, because the whole program is all about changing your entire lifestyle. So everything, 
you're going to be supported and being able to support everything. So it's going to be your hydration, your nutrition, and, and we support plant-based nutrition in, in lifestyle medicine. And then your sleep and your, uh, your emotional well-being and stress management and your happiness, all of it and more. I'm going to take care of you. I'll take good care of you. And I'm an incredible coach. I promise you, I've been coaching athlete, high-level athletes for over 45 years. All my athletes win and succeed. So you're going to win. And I'm a fantastic Thank coach. Thank you. As you can probably get. I actually was a Yale leader in college at California Lutheran University. That's what broke me out of my eggshell of being shy and timid. So I actually became, became a, a yell leader for the football team at California Lutheran University. And I would actually climb into the stands with a megaphone and yell and scream and jump and do all kinds of stunts and everything else to get everybody all fired up, pumped up, and cheered our football team on. And we played for the national championship. Yes, it was awesome. Okay, who else next? And by the way, you're gonna get an email with all kinds of information. So lots of information, plenty coming to you. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, got that. Got that. Okay, any other questions? Going once? Going twice? Okay, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. My, I have one major request, okay, and that is this. So I am passionate and committed to eliminating chronic disease from the face of the planet, empowering every single person to live a thriving, healthy, happy life. Now, I can't do it all by myself. So I need your help. So my request is that you help me in changing this world. Lifestyle medicine is out to change the world. So I need your help and being able to share this information. So I'm gonna send you this email. It's completely for free. My request is that you share this with people who want to actually change their lives and they're interested in being able to do that. Don't force it down anybody's throat. Don't do that, okay? But if they're interested in changing their lives, please share it. So if you accept my request, please raise your hand. Okay, that you accept my request. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, very good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I'll send you an email as soon as I can get that out to you. I'll send that out to you. So be on the lookout for that. And I look forward to seeing you next time, hopefully in my immersion program. So see you next time. Bye. Thank you, Ruben. You're welcome. You're welcome, Linda. Good to see you again. This is awesome. Awesome, awesome. Bye. Bye.